Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to part two of our five part soil recovery pro series, flood affected soil recovery. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the indigenous custodians of the land where I am on, the Gumbangia people. And I'd like to acknowledge the indigenous custodians of the land where you are all watching from now, either live or in the replay. Um, please comment in the box where you're watching from. If you know the indigenous custodians of the land where you are, please comment that as well. Um, I like to acknowledge the indigenous custodians per personally because I have a huge reverence for their custodian relationship. The sense of stewardship that they had, their place in nature, I believe that it's something that modern culture could learn a lot from. And if we don't, we're going to be forced to adopt that way through necessity uh, if we're not choosing it now. So I believe that it's every human's right to live in good relationship with the earth and to be custodian of it, not dominant over. And that means having a good respectful relationship with it. And that's why I like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples because at one stage, we all came from indigenous cultures no matter how far back that is. And we all came from cultures that understood right relationship with land. And I feel that it's our time now to return back to that to some extent and not a moment too soon. So just to recap, um, there are actually quite a few people joining this one for the first time live. So I'm gonna introduce myself again. My name's Ian, um, I'm from the UK. Um, excuse the funny accent, that's uh, just where I'm from. Um, I now live near Coffs Harbour in New South Wales. I've been here for two years uh, with my wife. We moved down from the Byron Shire um, before, where we were living before for about eight years. Um, I'm an environmental scientist, I'm a soil analyst, and I studied originally in the UK at the University of Brighton, and I immigrated out here in 2004 I worked in a ski resort in Victoria as the environment officer, and then I left to pursue my own self-employment, um, pursuing my passion with food. And I've taken my environmental science into understanding soil health and plant health, really in truth, because I love food and I've always wanted to grow better quality food. I grew up with a garden and I was very disappointed at my own attempts to grow food when I was a young man. And I actually, took it on myself to learn how to grow better quality food that tastes better. And that's where I've taken my career. Uh, I worked for several years for myself as a foodscaping, food gardening consultant. And I'd advise people how to set their gardens up to be low maintenance and to grow abundant foods around the property by identifying niche habitats where certain types of food would grow much better than others. Um, not just thinking within the realms of a veggie box, but looking about how we can actually foodscape the property, how we can introduce as many food plants as possible that are also ornamental and beautiful, but provide food for us as well. So my most recent employment was working, uh, managing a large um, subtropical property up in the Byron Shire. There was a large subtropical orchard. There was a very large vegetable garden, which my wife and I designed and managed. And it was a huge commitment managing such a large property and growing a lot of vegetables. And I learned a lot in that process. And so that's what got me to the point where I felt like it was time to take the skills I'd been learning out into the wider world. And I've since been applying my personal mission, which is to help inspire more people to grow some food and those that are growing to grow food of a higher quality and by quality, I refer to nutritional quality, uh, flavor, aroma, texture, storage quality, and to grow more of it, because I believe that the quality of food that we can get, I don't just believe it, I know it, the quality of food we can get from the store is vastly inferior to what food is capable of being, both genetically and biologically. So um, I have a passion for sharing the skills for helping people grow better quality food. And with all of these skills, with everything that's happened with the floods and the excessive rains, I felt like it would be a really useful service for me to be able to help people 
who are in crisis and I'd like to acknowledge those who've been in crisis and perhaps still are having lost possessions, properties, businesses, possibly even life. There's been a huge amount of trauma caught up with everything that's happened and I want to acknowledge that and it's my way of helping by helping people get back into their garden space which I know can be so profoundly healing, it is for me and I know that there are a lot of questions and concerns around how do I manage my garden since it was submerged beneath many meters of flood water or since the rain didn't stop and my, my soils are now soggy and smelly. Um, my plants are not healthy. Um, I may be concerned about contaminants. I've looked through all of the questions in the registrations that everyone has submitted. Not everyone's submitted a question, but some have. And those questions speak, you know, very similar themes of concerns around this stuff. So I'm, I know that this is needed. And thank you for all of you who have been in contact since the first one to thank me for what I've been doing. I appreciate that. Um, I, I really want to help in any way I can. And this feels like a really useful way of doing so. So yeah, without further ado, we'll jump in. I just want to acknowledge that I'm not sponsored. I'm not being paid um, by anyone. And there is no bias in my um, recommendations for any one particular company or any one particular brand. Anything I share around a company or a brand is just my personal preference. And I can explain why if you're interested to know, but I'm not actually profiteering from any of the advice I'm offering. And it's important for me to say that because this is a gift. This is me wanting to help. This is not me promoting my services. And that's where there actually is a challenge for me because I have an organization called the Gourmet Garden School. I help people grow better quality food. I work as a soil analyst. I help them analyze their soils and provide reports. And I provide mentoring and consulting for them growing better quality food. And I don't want to confuse those services with this genuine desire to help people. I'm giving a huge amount of information in these five series of talks. And I'm actively not mentioning any of the services that I offer because I don't want to come across as trying to profiteer from this. So if you have a question about something I offer, I invite you to take that up with me privately. I'm not going to discuss that publicly because I don't want this to be a promotional exercise. So one thing I will add is I am biased towards getting soils tested because I do see the merit to that. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss that because today's topic is soil structure and soil structure is huge. Um, the process for tonight is again, we're going to go through a brief presentation, um, well, maybe not so brief, about the same as last time. And then any questions you've got while I'm presenting, please put them in the chat. Uh, every question that's in the chat, I will go through at the end and we will endeavour to answer all of them in the allotted time that we have. Um, please don't hesitate if you've got a question. There are no stupid questions. Um, the only silly one is the one that didn't get asked. So, yeah, I think that's about all I needed to say up front and ready to jump in. Um, now, before we start the presentation, um, I invite you all to close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to do a brief visualization exercise. <clears throat> so, just Close your eyes. I assume all of you are watching from an inside of a building, but you may not be. If you're outside, just imagine you're inside a building and visualize what's around you. Visualize the cupboards, the furniture, the rugs, the beds, the chairs, the light fittings, all of the materials that fill the house. Get a sense of the space between you and those fittings and those things. Now, I'm gonna invite you to imagine that you are a soil microbe. Now, if you think of an alien, that's basically what soil microbes look like. They are as varied as you can possibly imagine. And as wild as your imagination is, there's probably a microbe that looks similar. 
And the invitation here is to get a sense of the space within the room and the objects that fill the room. And the objects are representative of soil particles. So they're the grains of sand and silt and clay. They're the lumps in the, in the soil. The soft furnishings might be the organic matter, the little bits of leaf or twig or dead organisms, bits of root, things like that. The space, the air in the room, well, that's the air in the soil. Soil needs pore space. It needs air in it so that you, the soil organism, can breathe in that space. Now, if you imagine the dust that's sitting over the surfaces, hopefully you've all got very clean surfaces, but I bet you there's a layer of dust over them already, even if you clean today. Those individual specks of dust, they are the minerals that your plants rely on. They are that small. They adhere to surfaces just like dust. They stick to it. There's actually an electrostatic charge that makes the minerals stick to the particles. And I want you to imagine now in that space, how easy it would be for you to occupy that space if the room was full of water. If the room had filled with water, you'd run out of oxygen pretty quickly. And that's the challenge we've got with saturated soils and flood affected soils. That there's not enough air in the soil. There may be enough minerals, there may be enough soil particles, but there's not enough air. And the clutter in the space, the amount of materials in your room are gonna affect how well that moisture drains. So if you're able to open doors and get that water out, if you've got piles and piles of rubbish in between you and the doors, it's gonna be harder for that moisture to leave. And this is when I'm talking about soil structure and how important good structure is, good organization in the space for the excess water to actually leave. Now, I hope that was useful. You're welcome to open your eyes and come back to the space. I can't say I've, thrown, I've done that before, that just came to mind today, but it's very similar. And when we're talking about soils, it's absolutely critical that we get structure in the soils, that we have good structure. Now, I'm gonna start the presentation. And when we talk about soil structure, we're talking about the arrangement with one R, not two, the arrangement of soil particles, organic matter, water and air spaces. That's all it is. It's the structure. It's the way these things are put together. Now, if you look in a textbook, you'll see this sort of description, not as artfully done as my wife has drawn here, but the percentages would be similar. In truth, the soils need a minimum of 25% air to be good, healthy soils. Ideally, they'd have more. But notice we need all of these things in relative proportion. We've got minerals, which is the actual soil particles. We've got water, we've got air, and then we've got organic material. And organic matter is a, is a grouped term for humus, which is essentially the final breakdown product. If you think of really good quality compost, a large proportion of it is humus. And then there's actual organic material that you may be able to recognize like roots, twigs, leaves, stems, things like that. And then there's organisms like actual bacteria, actual protozoa, actual nematodes, whether you can see them or not, they are of organic origin and they count as the organic matter in the soil. We need these kind of proportions in our soil. And many of us who've got flood affected soils have got significantly less air and significantly more water. Aggregates, an aggregate is a clumping of soil particles and it's created naturally. So if you imagine all of the 
items in your room, you know, the, the books and the, the, the appliances and things like that. It's like they've all been stacked together really neatly in a nice tidy way. The soil microorganisms release sticky glues and gels. Um, bacteria release it from their skin. Fungi are running through the soil with lots of little filaments and these stitch soil particles together. And what happens is that aggregates are formed by the clumping of, of soil particles. And when aggregates form, it turns uh, soil from, to use an analogy, if you imagine a bucket full of um, small marbles, and then if you imagine a bucket full of tennis balls, the, the way that it would drain is very differently. If you imagine a bucket full of sand particles and you pour a cup of water in, it's gonna take a lot longer for that cup of water to get down to the bottom and a lot longer for it to drain. Whereas if you imagine tennis balls, you pour it in and it would just flow over the edges of them and out the bottom almost immediately. Well, aggregates form that, that texture in soil that allows it to drain naturally, but it also allows it to absorb the moisture that it needs, meaning that we get good drainage, but adequate moisture retention as well. Now, this is a handful of very rich soil. Um, it actually had some compost applied um, several months before, and I think there are still some fragments of semi-composted material in it. But if you look closely at it, you can see the individual little lumps. Now, the way to test your soil for aggregates is to just grab a handful of the soil and to just gently squash it in between your fingers. And if it falls apart and it falls lots of little crumbs, that's a good aggregate structure. If you can't see any little lumps, if it's dusty, or if it's just like this solid lump that you have to squeeze really hard to break open, that is a soil that doesn't have good aggregate structure and it's an opportunity for improvement. So this is a close-up. You can just see some, some little lumps there. This is another kind of soil. This is a rich volcanic soil. Um, not as much organic material in this soil, which is why it appears more reddy brown color, but you can still see the little lumps in, in that picture. This, by contrast, is my boot working on a job where the soil was extremely high in magnesium and very sticky clay. And if you have boots that accrue mud like this, this is a great example of a, of a soil that is imbalanced and a soil that does not have good structure. This is the soil where I accrued that on my boots. And if you have soil that looks like that, I guarantee you, you have an opportunity for improvement. You can see the color contrast there between the topsoil, the very, very top layer where the grass is poking out, and then it quickly becomes those different colors of orange and gray and brown and reddy colors. Those are colors that signify poor drainage. If you have those colors in your soil, you, you have a history, a geological history of poor drainage, and it's absolutely an opportunity to improve because you're not gonna form good aggregate structure if you don't have good drainage initially. So soil structure is vital because it ensures gas exchange and gas exchange is a, is a quite a deep topic. And I'm just gonna touch on it here to say that you need oxygen in the soil for the oxygen requiring organisms. And you also need to release the carbon dioxide that the microorganisms respire or breathe out. These organisms need to breathe just like us. And if, if they can't have their carbon dioxide removed, and if they can't get fresh oxygen, they struggle. They may not die, but they struggle, and we need them to thrive. And that's why it's important that our soils breathe properly. Structure influences the soil microbial community, because if the soil can't breathe properly, then the kind of microbes that will thrive there are gonna be different. Structure influences the mineral balance, which basically means it's gonna affect the availability of minerals for plants. And it will also affect the redox state. Now, redox is a chemical um, um, term to describe the saturation or the dryness of soils. Um, it's basically referring to the, the form that the minerals are present in. Minerals are very complex. They can have many different states 
of, of presence in the soil. And that's called their valence state. And it's all about electrochemical charge, how many electrons they've got, how, how many they lose, they change in their availability and their reactivity. Well, redox changes according to the amount of oxygen in the soil. And if a soil was very dry, then it's gonna be very different redox state than if it's very wet. And it's important to understand that structure affects redox and redox is extremely important, as important or more than pH in terms of mineral availability for plants. These affect everything. They affect soil pH, they affect the way that your plants are gonna grow and perform. And when I say performance, I'm talking about their survival rate from a seed germinating, the quickness that they grow, the, the health with which they grow, the vigor and the abundance, the yields, and then of course, flavor, nutrition, pest resistance, all of these things. And if you've got soil of a good structure, you'll have much less maintenance to do in your garden. You'll also require much less inputs in terms of minerals, fertilizers, and any kind of pest management requirement. If you have poor structure, you set yourself up for problems, which is why structure is so important. So where do we start? There's three steps. The first is to assess your soil condition. The next is to identify the requirements that you've identified you need. And then the third is to amend as required. So the first one, assessing. Some of you may have lost your soil. Some of you may have had floodwaters scour it away. And in that instance, there may be a need to purchase new soil. Some of you may have soil in pots and it may be tempting rather than try to improve on what you've got, especially if you're concerned about contamination and you can't justify the money on getting a soil contaminant test, then it may be easier to just consider buying new soil. But before you do, I'd just like to say that while buying new soil may be a um, an ideal choice in some instances, and it certainly would be if you haven't got any, it's not a guaranteed improvement because manufactured soils are actually not that great. When I say manufactured soils, I'm referring to the kind of soil that you buy in a bag or that you buy from your landscape supply yard. You don't actually buy natural soil from a landscape supply yard. You buy blended product. You buy sand, compost, possibly some other organic materials, and occasionally it will have some real soil blended through it, but usually not. And consequently, they've got the term manufactured soils because they don't behave the same as natural soils do. And for that reason, they're not ideal. You also buy in contaminants. And this is a handful of plastic contaminant crap that came in from some soil that I bought for my garden only about a year ago. And it's the same story in every landscape supplies I've worked with. In my years of landscaping, every single one supplies products that contain materials like this, every single one. I've never bought a soil that doesn't have it. And it's just standard because the green materials that they use, the organic compost that they put in has come from green waste from a tip. And there are contaminants in that green waste that get chipped up and don't obviously break down in the composting process. And we end up buying them back in the compost. And in my experience, this is what you get every time. And it's just what is, unfortunately. Um, it's just important to know that you're buying things like this when you buy soil. So specific to flood affected soils and assessing soil is a broad topic. And I could talk for quite some time about it, but I am focused on flood affected soils specifically. Most people are gonna have problems with drainage. So there's a chance that your soils may smell. And that is a really good indicator that you've got poor drainage. And the smell is coming from the change in the microbial community. And it's coming from an anaerobic and oxygen not requiring or uh, an unable to survive in an oxygen rich environment organism. So the two terms I'm gonna use a bit today are aerobic which refers to organisms that thrive and require oxygen and anaerobic, that meaning that they don't need oxygen or that oxygen is actually toxic for them. When soils become saturated for extended periods, more than 24 hours, it begins a shift towards an anaerobic population. 
which can begin all sorts of changes that are not beneficial, one of which is smell. So observe the vegetation initially, because you may notice that some of your plants are wilting, and that's a good sign that they're not getting the oxygen that they need. It's almost like a drought response. And I intended to put some photos up here and I didn't, my apologies. Um, it's almost like a drought response. And yet, you know, the soil is actually absolutely saturated. So, you know, there's no chance that they've run out of water and it's the opposite. They've got too much. And when you see a plant doing that, it needs oxygen around its root system urgently. So the other is assessing the soil for drainage and actually just digging a small hole and pouring a cup of water in if you're not sure. Um, however, many of us are dealing with sloppy soils, so there's no question that there's poor drainage. And then also assessing your soil for texture. And this is a colourful diagram Georgie's put together that demonstrates how you can have too much of one or another. If you've got too much clay, you've not got enough sand or silt particles. When I'm talking about sand, seal and clay, it's all the same stuff. It's all soil minerals. It's all basically aluminium and, and uh, iron and silica compounds, but it's just the size of those particles that distinguishes them. But the size of them causes them to behave differently in the soil. And ideally, the ideal texture for most of what we wanna grow will be around the clay loam or loam part of this diagram. And so by assessing your soil texture, you can get a sense of whether or not there's something you can do to adjust the texture. There's two tests. One is the ribbon test, where you squeeze a handful of soil between thumb and forefinger, and to get a sense of how much of a ribbon you can make, the clayer your soil, the more of the, the ribbon you can make, the longer the ribbon. If you've got very sandy soil, you can't make a ribbon. Now, because we're talking about flood affected soils, most of you are gonna have clay soils, so you're going to notice that that's what you're seeing. The other test is a jar test, and that's where you literally put a handful of soil in water in a jar, shake it up for a while, and then it settles out. It can take some weeks to settle the clay, but initially you'll see the sand settle out, and after an hour or two, the silt, and then the clay will settle out over coming days. And then there's water on top of that, and there's sometimes organic material will float on top of that. This can give you an ideal visual representation of what your soil condition is. Now, if your soil is compacted, then you're going to have problems with oxygen in the soil. And most soils are compacted unless you have a really good structure. So it's, a, it's worth exploring. If, you, if it's hard for you to push your hand into your soil, it's compacted and it's going to need some kind of improvement to aerate the soil. If your soil's sticky, like it was on my boot in that picture before, then you've actually got an issue with an imbalance in your minerals. If you've got inadequate organic matter, then you're not going to have the conditions for the biology to thrive for them to be able to then make good aggregate structure. You can assess your organic matter visually by looking at your soil and looking at whether or not you can see a darker colour there or not. And obviously, if you get a soil test, that can give you an accurate number. But if you can't see any little critters in your soil, if you can't see any debris in your soil, then you probably would benefit from adding some more. The other one is pH. Now, for anyone that has a pH testing kit, they're very cheap and easy to get, $20 or so from Bunnings. Um, you can get the powder test where you actually just use barium sulfate powder and a green indicator dye to give you a color and you use the color chart to match up the pH of your soil or you can use a little um, probe that are a bit more expensive that you poke into the soil. You're wanting to optimize pH between 6.3 and 7. This is because of mineral balance but it's also to minimize contaminants becoming available in the soil. So the other assessment is getting a mineral balance test where you actually send a lab analysis away and you get an understanding of where your soils are at. So the importance of understanding mineral balance is that minerals have very, very different qualities. And I mentioned before about electrochemical charge and certain minerals compete with other minerals and certain minerals work cooperatively with other minerals. 
And so we call these synergistic and antagonistic effects. And an excess of one mineral can actually cause another mineral to not be adequately available for the plant, even though there may be adequate amount in the soil without there being the initial excess of the other. So it's important that we have a balance because it, what it does is it guarantees maximum mineral availability, minimal antagonization, which means optimum plant performance. The other reason you might want to consider getting a mineral test is because some minerals are very highly leachable. And these are, for example, sulfur, boron, and nitrate nitrogen. These minerals leave the soil very easily and quickly during heavy rainfall, especially if we have good drainage, which we want. But unfortunately, these minerals are very leachable and so can be lost. And in doing so, we may need to replenish them for optimum plant growth. Mineral balance will minimize contaminants. And that's because if we're able to keep the pH in that sweet spot between 6.3 and 7, it actually minimizes the availability of some of those toxic compounds, the contaminants that we spoke to in part one of this series. And with luxury levels of key minerals, you can have effects whereby phosphorus, for example, can precipitate arsenic out of the soil, meaning that it's there, but it's not available anymore for plant uptake and it's no longer as toxic. Calcium can actually chelate lead. Chelate is a, is a Greek, it comes from a Greek word, which means claw, and chelate is essentially isolating the lead compound, making it no longer reactive in the environment, which means that it's much less toxic. Zinc, if we've got adequate amounts of zinc, it can actually limit the uptake of cadmium. And sulfur is needed because sulfur is a very important mineral that provides detoxification compounds, both in the plant and in the soil. Sulfur is a very important mineral for our health as well. And any plants that are high in sulfur have a very potent detoxification effect on us as well. So some of you may have seen this kind of a chart before. I guarantee it wasn't this colorful though, because Georgie's drawn this and jazzed it up a bit. These soil textbooks are terribly dry. No wonder most people don't read them. Um, you can see here, to, to make sense of this, if you look at the top, you're looking at the pH scale, which is essentially the measure of alkalinity or acidity in your soil. pH 7 is considered balanced or neutral. And the ideal range for mineral availability for crops is between 6 and 6.5. The absolute perfect would be 6.3 or 6.4. And between six and seven is considered the optimum in terms of general speaking availability. There's reasons for that. One is that it guarantees the, on a chemical level, purely chemical level, um, availability of the most important minerals. As you can see, those top ones, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. The black, the width of the black line indicates the availability on a chemical level. I need to emphasize only on a chemical level because biology completely changed the game here. And we'll come to that in part three of this series. But in terms of the availability of those top few minerals, we're wanting a slightly acidic soil. If you look down lower, you see iron, manganese, boron, copper, and zinc. All of those become much more available at lower pH levels. And if we get down below six, especially if we get down below 5.5, we actually get into toxic areas in terms of availability of certain minerals. We can actually, um, aluminium isn't on this, but aluminium just goes off the charts when you get down below 5.5. And copper and zinc are very important trace minerals, as is manganese. But if it's too available, it can actually be phytotoxic, meaning that the plants can't thrive. And it can also create too much availability, meaning that we ingest too much if we're consuming plants that have too much in their tissues. So step two is to identify the requirements. Now, your assessment will have given you an insight as to what's needed, and this is your opportunity for improvement. One of the things to look at, if you've got poor drainage, is how high is your garden? 
um, one of the things I've got here in my garden is a couple of garden beds that are very low to the ground. And that height being so minimal is actually the reason that there's poor drainage. My subsoil here is poorly drained. And if I don't have my garden adequately high above it, there's nowhere for the water to go. And so it may be worth considering whether or not you've got adequate height initially in your garden. If you do, but you've still got poor drainage, then you definitely wanna be doing something to improve that drainage. If you're down at ground level, then it may be in your interest to actually build your garden up a bit. Now, the bad smell, that's because of an increase in um, anaerobic organisms, and you need to increase the aerobic microbe population to remedy that. If you've got a lab analysis, then that's gonna give you a tailored mineral prescription, and you can actually use that to remedy your soil structure, chemically speaking. So it's a much easier pathway ahead. The, if you've got heavy clay, if you've identified that you've got a very heavy clay, then you're gonna to need to add aggregates, well, either add aggregates in the form of sand, or you're gonna to wanna to encourage the soil biology to create aggregates by stimulating biology. You're gonna to wanna to add organic matter, that's the OM, and biochar is another excellent choice of organic material to add, as is probably calcium. Heavy clay soils typically are deficient in calcium. And that picture you saw before of my boot, well, that was a sticky soil. And if you look at point three, a sticky soil is always deficient in calcium. And it's because there's too much magnesium and not enough calcium. And there's actually a relationship between these minerals. They're actually antagonistic. They're opposite. They're, they have opposing effects. Calcium opens the soil. And it is, the word flocculate applies here. It flocculates the soil. And magnesium tightens the soil. So if you imagine a beach sand, a beach sand is very loose and there's no structure to it. And although there's a lot else lacking in a beach sand, there's not enough magnesium to hold those particles together. Whereas a very heavy clay soil has got too much magnesium and not enough calcium. Calcium leaches quite quickly and easily from soils, um, especially when we're looking at a geological time. And so that's why many soils are calcium deficient and why many soils that have been leached or unimproved for a long time will be quite poorly drained, will be quite a heavy clay and will benefit from adding some sort of calcium. And just to come back up, if you've got compacted soil, if you notice the soil is compacted and tight, you need to break that compaction. This is a time when you actually need to get in and mechanically break it. You need to get in a fork and you need to put in some, some hard work to actually break open that soil and turn it over and to do your very best to break open those lumps. And when you do so, you need to add with those things up the top. Um, you need to add organic materials or biochar, any amendments that you want to add, you want to put that into the soil when you're breaking it up so that it doesn't just compact again several weeks later. You're wanting to do this once and do it properly and then not have to do it again. Compacted soils can be a, a one-time fix if you do it properly. But if you're having to do it every year, it's because you've not put in the right amendments. So if you've identified low pH, if you've got a soil test kit and it's coming back with a, a pH of say less than six, then I guarantee that you are deficient in either calcium, magnesium, potassium, or sodium. Most people are deficient in calcium, or say most soils are deficient in calcium. Sometimes it can be both or all three. Rarely is it sodium, but it can be. Um, the thing is we don't need much sodium in the soil and so the chances are that it's more than just sodium that's, that may be deficient. Um, where we get a lot of rainfall, sodium can leach out quite easily because it's very soluble, but around the desert, dry climates, sodium is usually rarely um, deficient. So you're gonna to wanna to add calcium most probably. If you've got a high pH, then you're probably excessive in those alkalizing minerals listed above. Often, you're high in magnesium, but you can also be high in calcium or potassium or sodium. Magnesium is more alkalizing than calcium, which means that you may actually have a high pH soil that is still deficient in calcium, 
and by putting out more calcium, it will displace the magnesium and reduce the pH. And it gets quite complex here, and, and I'm going to just keep it um, brief because I don't want to take too long trying to explain these concepts. But it's enough to know that pH is a really rough guide. It can be a useful guide, but it isn't the only lens by which to view the chemistry of our soils. Ultimately, we want to be looking at our soils from more of a microbial level than a chemical level. And mineral balance and soil testing is a really great tool, but it's only one tool and it's only one step in the journey. So step three, amend as required. If you've got a heavy clay soil, you're gonna to wanna to add sand or perlite. Perlite is a superheated uh, mineral that's essentially been puffed up through the heating process. It's inert, it's a mineral, it's not styrofoam, even though it looks like it, and it's not in any way damaging for your soils. It is, however, an industrially manufactured product, and it does come with quite a high embodied energy. So if you're looking to do this in, a, in as ecological way as possible, perlite's not your first choice. Um, the most ecological way is to be putting out organic materials or biochar and probably calcium. If your soil is compacted, then you're going to need to break that compaction. There's no easy way around it. I recommend a fork because if you use a shovel, you're likely to cut lots of worms in half and it's unlikely that they're going to survive that process. You can use a rotary hoe. Um, there's nothing wrong with a rotary hoe used once, but it does smash the soil structure and you absolutely need to be putting out some amendments into that soil to recover it. Otherwise, you end up with a very compacted soil several months later. You definitely don't want to use a rotary hoe on a regular basis unless you're very skilled with the way that you're using it. Sticky soils, you're going to need to add lime or gypsum or soft rock phosphate. These are all sources of calcium and the kind of calcium that you would apply would be indicated by the pH of the soil. If you've got a low pH, then you're going to want to try adding calcium that I would start with calcium and then see whether or not it could be the other minerals that are deficient. And if you've got a high pH, then you're gonna be deficient in sulfur and you're gonna to want to put some kind of sulfur amendment out. If you have a very high pH, you may wanna consider elemental sulfur. That's what the ES is. And that's a yellow powder that you buy from the rural supplies or from Bunnings or wherever. Um, or you can use gypsum and gypsum is calcium sulfate which is calcium and sulfur, and it can be very good for improving poorly drained soils if you have a pH that is above 6.5. If you have a low pH below that, don't use gypsum because it can cause all sorts of problems because the sulfur can react in the acidity. If you've got a low pH, you'll want to use ag lime. Uh, if you've got low organic material, then add some compost. Um, ideally the best quality compost you can get. Um, failing that, worm castings, and if not, then plant materials. Literally digging through plant materials into your soil or burying them and putting the soil on top can work wonders. The calcium rule, again, is if your pH is below 6.5, add only agricultural lime. Agricultural lime is powdered limestone. It's a rich source of calcium, about 40%. It's very slow to assimilate into the soil and it's not the best choice of calcium amendment, but it is an appropriate choice for a low pH soil. If you have a high pH soil above 6.5, then add gypsum. It's by far the better choice. And because it's, it's much more quickly assimilated into the plants, it's, it's some of that calcium is actually water soluble and will be very quickly available to the plants. But if you put gypsum out in a low pH soil, you can actually create problems with the sulfur. So be very, very careful. Luxury levels of organic matter is critical. I cannot emphasize that enough. Now, it's, it's actually, it's difficult to, to describe the complexity of this, but by putting out organic material, you will both buffer contaminants and you'll make them more available. How on earth can that be the same thing at the same time? Well, 
it depends on the kind of organic material that you put out. But initially, putting out organic materials, especially if it's compost or something that's high in fulvic acids, you can actually make the minerals or contaminants more available in the short term, which is a good thing if you're wanting to extract them from the soil. And then longer term, over coming months, they will become much less available. And organic material in general will buffer the contaminants, especially over a longer period. And organic material is critical for getting the microbial growth in the soil that is actually going to decontaminate your soil and improve nutrient cycling and maximize plant growth. I cannot emphasize adding organic material enough. It really is critical. If you're deficient in it, you're, you're holding yourself back from your soil being uh, a top performing soil. So ideally you would add non-contaminated compost as in compost that didn't go underneath floodwaters that you're not concerned about, that doesn't smell bad. If the compost doesn't smell good, you're better off not using it because you will be putting out unfavorable biology into a soil that's already got an abundance of unfavorable biology. There's nothing wrong with anaerobic organisms per se, but it's the abundance that the prop is the problem. And we don't wanna add more to them. We're wanting to add more aerobic organisms, if anything. Worm castings are literally the perfect fertilizer and perfect organic material for your soil. If only you can get enough of them. You don't need that many worm castings, but they are a really fabulous amendment for soils. Plant materials, cheap and easy. Do a big prune in your garden, bury those materials. If you're pruning plants that have been submerged under flood water, don't use those materials in your food garden. Compost them separately use that compost for ornamental gardens only. But if you can get other plant materials like buying a bale of straw or burying um, tree prunings or anything like that that you feel is, is definitely not contaminated, then burying your compost, burying your compost, you know, your food scraps from the garden, anything like that can work wonders to put organic materials into the soil. It may not be perfect soil for growing in initially, but over coming months, it will be. Manure is commonly used, but it's not really that great in truth. And the main reason is because it can contain contaminants. It contain um, nematicides, which is a worm killer for animals that have been wormed. And it can also contain excess minerals, particularly phosphorus and zinc. And if you have a soil that is deficient in those minerals and you put manure, then that could be the perfect amendment for your garden. Many home garden soils, however, are already very high in phosphorus and putting out high phosphorus manure can actually create new imbalances in your mineral profile. So manure is okay, but manure is not something you wanna be putting in your soil every year. And if you have a habit of doing that, then I encourage you to choose something different for this process. Biochar, it is truly a rising star. Um, for anyone that doesn't know biochar, it's, it's an up and coming product that's finding huge application potential, both commercially, broad acre farming and small scale at home. The reason it's so good is because it basically takes organic materials and then uses them to improve soil for a very long time. It's very long lasting in the soil. It can actually last for centuries and not break down, but have beneficial effects while it's there. Uh, it can essentially take carbon from plants that are growing and convert it into a form that is very unreactive and essentially capturing carbon and putting it into the soils. So depending on the source will depend on the quality, but biochar is a really excellent choice. It's made by heating organic material to a high temperature with little or no oxygen. And that's the point. This biochar is essentially charcoal, but it's not charcoal. And the distinction between it is it was done without oxygen, which means that the minimal amount of, of actual um, pyrolysis or burning has taken place. There's, the, there's more organic material in a good quality biochar than there is in charcoal. And a good quality biochar was actually extinguished when it was hot. And what happens when we extinguish a hot fire 
is the water that's applied or the liquid turns to steam and that steam forces air between the pores of those hot pieces of, of woody materials and it forces them to become more open. It increases the surface area. And so there's quite a big difference in terms of performance between charcoal and biochar, but charcoal can also be used as a substitute. It improves soil porosity when it's dug into the soils, which means more air, more space between those soil particles. It provides microbial habitat, homes for microbes to live in and thrive around. It can actually attract the positive and negatively charged minerals, although the, the attraction it has for negatively charged minerals declines over time. This is important because clay is negatively charged and it's very good at holding on to positively charged minerals. But negatively charged minerals can actually be repelled like two magnets that are repelling each other. They can actually be repelled from a high clay soil. And that's one of the reasons we need high organic, less organic material levels in the soil because organic matter has an affinity for negatively charged minerals. And those minerals that may leach during heavy rains, the reason they leach is because they're negatively charged. Those, the nitrate, the boron, and the, I've had a mental blank, sulfur. Uh, so biochar can be really good for holding minerals. Not all biochar is equal. The actual wood that was used to create it or, or material has an effect over its performance. It's also typically a higher pH, maybe from eight to 11, although I have seen biochars that tested um, below seven, so in the acidic range. So it's not all guaranteed, but typically you'd wanna be applying biochar to an acidic soil, not an alkaline soil. And it's best to charge it before it's used. And by charge, I mean, use some kind of microbial inoculant or some kind of fertilizer that the biochar is soaked in first because it basically populates the biochar with microbes and food and then you put it out into the soil and it becomes much quicker to work whereas if it's just put out straight you know the day after it was made it's essentially a sterile product and it needs the biology in the soil to eventually colonize it whereas if you inoculate it first with beneficial organisms you can do wonders. Contaminant caution, um, generally increasing the organic materials, as I said, will immobilize, detoxify, and actually degrade the contaminants that we're concerned about. Those heavy metals in the previous session, those sorts of things break down when we've got good organic matter levels. But as I said, young compost and fulvic acids can actually hold on to those chemicals, isolate them, but make them more plant available in the short term. And that's why it's important that the first crop we grow, if we've had floods affecting our soils, is not a food edible crop. It's a green manure crop. It's a phytoremediation crop. It's a crop that we remove the biomass from. So in summary, we assess the soil condition and drainage. We aim for free draining soil. Luxury levels of organic material are really important. Contaminants affect the mineral balance. So consider testing for contaminants and consider testing for mineral balance. Consider mineral testing for optimum crop health and manage pH as best you can. And as best you can is, you know, it's not easy to manage pH and it isn't critical, but if you test your soils and it's very acidic or very alkali, there's a good opportunity to do something about it. So thank you. Um, in the PDF that gets emailed, there is going to be a link to the survey. And there's the one reference I did from this one. I didn't have to research as much for this talk. And there's some contacts at the end. So I'll just stop the share. Now, I've actually got a message there in the comments. Um, before I go through the questions, for everyone who's watching um, either live or the replay I'd really appreciate um, the survey filled out just so I can get feedback from what um, was good what was not whatever can be better um, obviously I'm wanting to do the best I can here and also for notifications of any future talks I didn't mention the electrolyte rescue remedy um, I've put a video on YouTube 
some of those minerals leach out of soils when we get excessive rains. So it doesn't matter whether your soil's flooded or you've just had heaps of rain, like most of us have, some of the minerals leach quite easily and quickly. And you can easily put your own little rescue remedy together to put out some of those very easily leachable minerals at home. Um, it's basically just sea salt and borax and sugar. And by putting it out, you're just replenishing some of those electrolytes, just like we would if I had diarrhea and I was losing liquids I would be running out of electrolytes. And by having an electrolyte liquid, it can replenish me and make me feel much better. And it's the same for our soils, believe it or not. Um, I'll just say again, please share this series with anyone that you feel may benefit. And the link there is for the registration. There's a link there for anyone who wants to join without registering. Of course, not registering. I'm not gonna email the stuff to you because I won't have your email. Um, but some people are, prefer not to register. They don't want to give their email. Perfectly fine. I want to help as many as I can. And also, if you consider sharing a review, I had some lovely feedback from the last one. And reviews are always great because it you know, gives people confidence in, in what, they're, what they're exploring when they're working with me. So thank you for that. Now I'm going to go through the questions. Um, Okay, sorry to ask. Hang on, let me just go back to the start. Phil and I are watching the same link. We haven't been able to listen to the first session yet. Oh, that's, that's fine. Um, nice to see so many locals. Um, okay, Debbie, I'm only visiting home, so not there to start all the soil recovery, but I would like to know if my pineapples that are growing will still be edible. Some with chilies, same with chilies, passion fruit, blueberry, ginger, sweet potatoes, which are going nuts. I uh, also do I need to take out strawberry plants? Can I keep my lemon, orange, mulberry trees? Okay, so this is kind of going back from the previous topic. If you have any food plant that you would be harvesting the edible part of within the next eight weeks, that is not consumable. That is not safe to consume. There could be a risk of chemical contaminants or biological contaminants in the skin of that food. Don't risk it, chop it off, compost it. With regards to plants that are growing in soil, so your pineapples, if they don't have a fruit on them yet, they may be fine. And the only thing that may be a problem is if you have chemical contaminants in your soil. That would be the same for all of those other food crops you named. If you have contaminants, if you're concerned about floodwaters bringing contaminants, then I encourage you to get your soil contaminant tested. Ultimately, it's up to you. And there's no guarantee that your soil is contaminated, even if it was inundated with floodwaters. From my understanding from the laboratory EAL in Lismore, they still haven't found high levels of um, PCBs or polio, polycyclic, polyaromatic um, hydrocarbons, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, <laughs> I'll get my words right, um, or any of the BTEX group, any of the nasty toxins have not shown up yet in any soils that have been tested. That said, if you live next to an industrial area, yeah, there's a chance there may be. So consider it. I would just get a sense of it yourself. The important thing to remember is that some contaminants have no flavour, no smell and no colour. So there can be no way of knowing for some of them. If the soil does have contaminants, the only process you've got open to you is to improve the biology of the soil, to get the soil really thriving by improving the soil structure and then boosting the biology and then using plants, which is what this whole series is about. So whether you've got contaminated soil or not, this is what you need to do because it's really the only realistic choice. And therefore, I would recommend following this process. And if you're concerned about contaminants, then get your soil contaminant tested. Um, everything that we're gonna talk about is going to provide the opportunity for your soil to naturally decontaminate. Um, as I said, like sweet potatoes and ginger, if you're planning to harvest them in less than eight weeks, I would not consume those foods. Um, What's the difference between clay soil and sticky soil? Well, um, clay soil is essentially 
a soil that has um, predominantly clay, a lack of silt and sand grade particles, it will be very firm soil. A clay soil can just be a mineral soil that's full of very small particles. A sticky soil is a soil that could be high clay that also has high levels of magnesium. Now, it's often that we find the two together. A very clay soil is often very sticky because um, calcium flocculates the soil, opens it up, makes it more porous and airy, and clay is the opposite. So typically, a clay soil is deficient in calcium, excess in magnesium, and will probably be sticky. But when you get a really sticky soil, that's because there's very high levels of magnesium. And when you've got that, you really do want to add some sort of calcium amendment and you'll see it change significantly. That will help the biology actually create the aggregates, which you then get much better soil structure through. So I hope that's answered your question. Um, Alf, why did my sweet potatoes give lots of leaves, but hardly any actual potatoes? I have an above ground corrugated iron garden and potatoes only grew against the walls of the garden. I had lots of seaweed and horse manure and delivered bulk soil in the garden. Well, Alf, there's a really good example there of a mineral imbalance. And what happens when you've got a root crop, sweet potatoes, I mean, most people grow them for the root, you can eat the leaves and there are varieties you grow just for the leaf, but I'm gathering that you want them for the root. The, the root requires minimal nitrogen, high levels of potassium to actually swell. For those roots, and the same with potatoes, for those roots to actually swell and be really nice, juicy, delicious, sweet potatoes, you need to have good levels of potassium in the soil and other minerals, but potassium's the key one here. Excess nitrogen, will throw the plant into a vegetative phase, which will be growing many more leaves. And so it basically, the, the minerals are imbalanced and the, the plant is not able to do what it needs to do. So it's going through a vegetative phase now. Nitrogen is a temporary mineral in the soil. It tends to be um, leached out of the soil or it tends to get used up by the organisms and then it's replenished microbially. So unless you're putting out more, this will fix itself in time. But typically soils that you buy will be quite high in nitrogen and the horse manure would have been very high in nitrogen. And basically that's why you've got vegetative growth, not adequate tuber growth. Um, definitely avoid adding any more nitrogen products, any liquid fish or any blood and bone, anything that's got nitrogen in it, don't add to your soil. In truth, nitrogen is a, is a mineral that most of us abuse and most of us don't need nitrogen added to our soils 95% of the time. The atmosphere is 78% is nitrogen. And if we have the microbial community in the soil, they use that nitrogen to make it available for the plants. We shouldn't be adding nitrogen. In doing so, we can cause all sorts of trouble. So, um, Jody, we live on a property. Can we generate our own biochar? Yes, you can. Biochar is um, very easy to do yourself. You just need a, a vessel to cook the material in. So um, what you choose for your feedstock will depend on what your property is abundant in. You might have macadamia shells. You might have peanut shells. You might have... Um, small branches and twigs that you want to coppice, which means to chop off and then they regrow and then you chop them off every year or every few years. Whatever you're using, it doesn't really matter as much as how you're gonna be getting it nice and small. So you wanna chip things to make, you know, wood chips or smaller pieces, and then put it into a vessel that has some holes in it, but is then gonna go into the fire. So on a really small scale you could just use an old coffee can and put a few handfuls of very small um, you know twigs and leaves and even grass and things like that I mean grass burns very quickly so it's not ideal you're better with woodier materials but you put them in you close the lid you throw it in a fire you need the fire all around it and then you take it out when it finishes smoking so the gases that come off are actually going to burn so you'll see flames coming out from the gases when that stops, that's when the, the wood has adequately lost its gases and then you can remove it 
and you've got biochar. You need to extinguish it. If you open the lid and the oxygen comes in, usually that will just ignite almost instantly because it's very hot, it's burning, it's just not got air. As soon as the air gets to it, boom, it will just explode. So on a very small scale, you can do it with a coffee can. The quality of the metal of a coffee can isn't great. You may only get one use or two uses before it will melt. So if you're doing it yourself, you probably want to use a drum or something with much thicker steel. I have seen it done with old gas bottles that have been cut open and then a cylinder made with it. And that's obviously very durable, lasts for a long time. But um, I just suggest looking up on YouTube for some innovative ideas for making your own biochar. The really excellent strategies will actually utilize the gas because the gas that comes out is a valuable fuel. It's a gas fuel that can be used and tapped for something else, either to fuel the combustion of the fire in which you're making the biochar, which is very elegant in my opinion, or it's removed and used as a resource for another purpose. But, you know, that's, a, that's getting in there. That's doing a really good job. And that will probably take a, a fair bit of practice and investment. Um, Shakina, when adding organic matter, biochar, sand, etc., to clay soil, do you just lay them on top of the clay soil? So, no, I don't. If you've got a clay soil and you're needing to improve the drainage of it, this is the one time you want to dig it through. Now, your annual compost top up for your garden, put it on top, no need to dig it in. I'm not a fan of digging garden soils. It's absolutely unnecessary most of the time. However, if you've got a soil that's not draining properly because it's too high in clay, you need to dig those materials through. So I would suggest that you actually, to save digging it twice, I would actually put those materials on the soil and then I would dig. Or if you're not sure what your soil is like and you want to just check it out, dig the soil first, then throw the materials on and then just gently stir them through. A fork is the only tool for this. I really don't see a shovel as being very useful because, as I said, it will cut organisms, worms and things. But it will also um, not blend the material as well and not aerate the soil as well. So I would always mix them through and then you'll want to stabilise that soil by growing some plants in it and mulching that soil. If you've done it well, you won't need to disturb that soil ever again, unless you're digging potatoes or something like that, where you might actually be digging it, you won't ever have to do it again. So once you do it uh, with the physical components like the sand or biochar or something, then you basically invest in the microbes because the microbes are gonna do the work for you. Um, compost tea, yes. Compost tea. Um, I love it. It's definitely uh, an excellent choice. And it's the one we'll be diving into in series in session three, when we're talking about biology. Um, compost tea absolutely can improve soil structure because of the microbes that are coming with it. But because this is separated, um, you know, with next session is microbes. So hold, hold that door. Okay. How can you watch the recording for last one? Excellent, I, I hope you received an email. If you didn't, I'm going to just find the link right now. Um, if you didn't, if you actually, if you registered before the first one, you would have received the email for it. If you registered between the first one and this one, then of course you haven't received the link to the, to the replay. And I'll be sending the link to the replay in this coming email for both the first and the second session. Um, I'll just see if I can find it now so that it's easy. And oh, yeah, here we go. Okay, so that's the link for the first one on YouTube. Um, it will all come through in the email as well. So, um, fungi for decontamination, mycelium running. Yes, I've read the book myself. I love it. Um, big fan. Again, fungi are microbes, session three. Um, do you need to get rid of cover crops that are used to draw out contamination? 
or can you compost and dig them back into your anything else or do anything else? So if you're concerned about contamination, you absolutely need to remove the materials that you're growing. The cover crop, the green manure crop, the phytoremediation crop, whatever you want to call it, the first crop or several crops that you grow, you want to remove those completely. You could leave the roots in some instances. It depends on if you know what contaminants you're dealing with. Some plants will accumulate them in the roots as well. For safety, you're probably best just to remove the whole plant and compost them. And I say compost them because I don't, I don't advocate putting them in the bin. I think that's an awful act because in the bin, they go to the tip where they're turned into green waste, which is composted and sold back to home gardeners. So there is no way um, ultimately use disposing of them responsibly is is what i'm an advocate for and that would be composting them and using them for an ornamental garden there's a very low chance that the compost is going to be a contaminant but there is a chance and you know as um, giving advice here i'm going to say exactly what i should say which is don't use it for your food crops if you're not concerned about contamination generally if, you're, if your soil hasn't experienced flood waters and you're not concerned about contamination, absolutely leave that material on site. I wouldn't dig it back through, but you can. And I wouldn't dig it because you actually damage the structure that the root systems were just busy building. You're best off to actually cut it off at the roots and lay it down and mulch over the top, or that is the mulch, or to use a non-invasive technique like putting plastic over it to solarize it so that you kill the plants and then you can plant into that again. Soil structure is a, is, a, is a consequence of microbial activity if the soil texture is right and the soil microbes do things year on year to improve the structure. Every time we dig the soil, we kind of take it back. We take it back every time. So digging a green manure crop into the soil will kill it and it will make it rot down quicker but it comes at a cost to our soil structure. So there's nothing wrong with doing that. And if you've got soil that's compacted and needing some kind of aeration, then I would absolutely dig it through because that would be a really great technique. But if you have a soil that's becoming well-drained and a reasonable structure, I wouldn't ever dig my green manure crop back through. So think of it as a, as a sequence. Initially, you might consider doing that and Longer term, no, you wouldn't want to dig it back through. But if you're concerned about contamination, definitely remove those materials until you're not concerned anymore. And how long it takes with phytoremediation depends on the levels of contaminants in the soil. So one crop could be great, but in truth, it could take a decade to, to continually crop soil that's very toxic, it could take a decade of continual cropping. If you've got mild levels of contaminants, building the biology in a soil will essentially immobilize and detoxify your soil within months. And you may want to get testing to, to guarantee that. But um, my recommendation is that you assume the first crop needs to be removed. And then if you're concerned after that, get it tested. And if you're not, then proceed as you would with growing materials and laying them back down on the soil. Um, Thea, my pleasure. Andrew, does charcoal come from a normal fire, a burn pile or a wood heat to have the same benefits as biochar? No, it doesn't. Um, it is carbon and it can be microbial habitat. And so it will provide um, an amendment that helps to open up the soil, uh, increase porosity and provide a microbial habitat. And depending on what pH it is, it may be a beneficial amendment for your soil if you've got an acidic soil but it's not as good as biochar. As I said, biochar has been extinguished. It's got more surface area. It's more of a microbial habitat. And you would always want to use it ground quite small as well. Big chunks, they're not going to be much help. You really do want to grind it into a finer, um, you know, two to five mil kind of grade so that it's actually going to be spread through the soil. And I would always dig biochar through. I wouldn't just lay it on the surface. Um, it's not going to be beneficial if it's just laying on the surface. So, you know, long, long term, you don't keep using biochar. You just want to use it once or twice and dig it through. Um, wood ash, I will just add, the actual white part of a fire, that is really toxic. 
in the sense that it's microbially toxic and it's very, very high in potassium. Um, that's where the word potassium potash came from. And it's very, very reactive. So if you want to use it as a fertilizer, by all means do, but only use a maximum of one handful per square meter. And that equates to very little. When you sprinkle it out, you go, you know, come on, surely I can use more than that. Trust me, don't. You will quickly imbalance your soils and you will retard the microbial diversity in the surface layers. And you don't want to use that if you already have an excess of potassium. So this is where adding amendments is a difficult one without a soil test to really know where we stand. Um, should we be turning soil that's too wet? Should we be turning chop and drop into the soil or leaving it on the surface? Working soils that are wet can damage structure. It's particularly a problem when you're dealing with mechanical equipment like a tractor, your know, heavy, heavy machinery compacts the soil and damages the structure. In your home garden with a fork, working a wet soil is much less damaging. Still not ideal. I would absolutely wait a little bit but if your soil is soggy and the plants are very sad and it may even start to smell, you're gonna to need to do something quick because it's gonna deteriorate the longer you leave it. So for the potential of damaging soil structure by working it when it's wet versus the damage of not doing anything, I would get in and do something. At the very least, get a fork and just lightly prise the soil back just to kind of get a bit of air in there. Like if you can just, you don't need to turn it and smash it and you know invert the soil just to get some air that deep because if there's no air down there at the moment then how is it going to get there if you don't do something mechanical to open the soil up so just lightly forking the soil if you feel like it's time to improve the soil then absolutely turn your chop and drop into the garden soil um, this is the one time i would advocate doing that um, if you've got a poorly drained soil, make sure that you're putting out adequate organic materials, um, either plant materials or wood chip. As I say, wood chip, I'm going to hesitate because fresh wood chip will tie up nitrogen in your soil. Not a major problem long term, a year or two from now, but short term, you'll be cursing because things won't grow well. So if you're going to turn wood chip in, make sure it's quite old wood chip, preferably semi-composted or composted and um basically yeah anything physical that's going to help improve the body of the soil maybe some sand maybe some biochar um kelly we have a number of earthworms close to the soil surface is that an indicator for soil structure or lack of oxygen in the soil so worms are a great indicator for fertility worms also thrive in oxygen depleted conditions and therefore are not a good indicator for a soil that has good structure. You can have a soil with terrible structure that still has plenty of worms. So I would say that it's great that you've got the worms and I would look to the physical tests yourself to determine whether or not it has good structure. Most soils don't have perfect structure. Most soils are a bit compacted and they don't drain as well as they could. And if you push your hand, like pull the mulch back, push your hand in, if you can't get your hand down to your wrist easily, your soil's compacted and it needs something to fluff it up. So it's um, easiest done by digging some compost through, maybe a little bit of sand, something like that, and some biochar as well. Um, great. Is it good to uh, ask wood ash to compost? Um, Again, it's, it's antimicrobial, so I, would, I wouldn't mind putting a little bit of wood ash in my compost, just knowing that I'm putting a little bit of um, potassium and any other minerals that didn't go as up as gases when it burned. But typically speaking, I'd say no. Um, a small amount, like really small amount, okay, fine. But definitely don't empty your um, fireplace out every week or every month and tip that into the compost, you'll end up with compost that's highly alkaline, poor in its microbial diversity and excess in its, in its potassium levels. And compost is high in potassium anyway, because potassium is a mineral that accrues in the stems of plants 
And so most of the plant materials we compost will have stems in them. And you don't want to really add more potassium to a compost heap. Other minerals, yes, but not really potassium. So a little bit of charcoal or biochar in the compost heap, excellent, because it's going to absorb the microbes in that process and that will help enrich the soil. But I wouldn't be adding too much um, wood ash. So that brings us to the end of our questions. Does anyone else have any other questions before we call it a day? I'm going to have a sip of my tea. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> Inspiring and complex. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I am. This is such a huge topic. I really am just touching over it. Um, I think that's why I talk so fast, because I'm trying to get as much info in as I can. All right. Well, I'm going to stop the recording.